All right, so, to, so right now we're going to talk about a kind of learning that is known as operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is different than what you might have heard of as described as classical conditioning, which is what, um, which is what Pavlov is doing with his dogs. That's something you might have heard of. Pavlov trained dogs to drool when a bell was rung because so they were originally drooling from the food so that was causing food was causing the drooling eventually they start drooling because of the bell because these are rung together so many times and the important thing about this is that the drool is is a natural response right the drool is something dogs dogs just do that when they see tasty food they just drool just anyway I think it's kinda of gross but that's what happens and so it's a natural response. The dog isn't thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to drool because I see that food. It just happens. Now, operant conditioning is distinguished from this because all of the behaviors in operant conditioning are voluntary. So this is like something, you know, that if you were, I don't know, com complaining to your boss that you didn't get enough time off because you just really, you just really want to go to Hawaii and your boss gets upset, he's like, no, that's absurd, I'm not going to give you those time off. No. You're not going to do that again. You're not going to ask him again for time off, unless you want to get fired. Now, asking for time off, that was a voluntary behavior. But your boss's reaction affects whether you're going to do that again. And in this case, he reacted badly, so you're probably not going to do that again. So you can see it's it's the same kind of learning in both cases. You're 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 doing something and you're getting a response. In this case, it's you're choosing to do something and you get a response. In this case, you're learning to reassociate a natural response like drooling to food with an unnatural trigger. So you're drooling to a bell. So you're both you're, both of them are learning, but this one is more about behaviors that you're choosing to do, and what can happen when you choose to do a behavior is you can basically get one of four types of responses to that behavior. So these are the kinds of responses that you can get. You can get a punishment or you can get a reinforcement and this will make you want to do that behavior again because that's a good thing. Um, but it gets a little complicated because there's actually two types of punishments and two types of reinforcements. And how this breaks down is that in both cases there's positive and there's negative. And this might sound a little weird because what that, what that sounds like to me when I first learned about it is that a positive punishment, that doesn't sound right. That's not, punishment's never a good thing. And then that's not what it means. What it means is that basically the positive and the negative are adding or subtracting a stimulus. And to make this a little clearer, psychologists describe stimuli in, in as one of two things. It's either appetitive, a good thing, or it's aversive, a bad thing. But in how this applies then, how this works out in terms of positive and negative punishment and reinforcement, is essentially positive is the addition of one of these things, negative is the taking away of one of these things. So maybe you used to I don't know, get a bonus and now you don't, that would be a negative punishment because it's something that you used to get that was, that was good, but now you don't get it anymore. And the same thing happens over on the reinforcement side. So a positive reinforcement is basically the addition of something good. So maybe you, you get more money, that's a, an addition of something really awesome. And a negative reinforcement is the taking away of something bad. So, you know, let's say that you I don't know, you really don't like someone and they sit next to you and then you get to move and they're no longer there, they're taken away and that's a, a negative reinforcement. So you can see the terms themselves are counterintuitive, but if you think about it in this, if you break it down in this way, that it's either the addition of something good or bad and the taking away of something good or bad and that that's either going to encourage or discourage a behavior, it gets a little easier to understand. Now I think the best way to really hammer this home is to kind of go through and, and see how this, would, how this would work in real life. We've got a, a, a guy named Larry. There he is. 
Larry has decided that he is going to become a pickup artist. He wants to get all the ladies. They are going to love him. He just has to figure out how. He's not that good at it now. He's been reading on, he's been reading some materials on the internet and he thinks he can give it a shot. So maybe let's say what he tries first is a pretty, pretty standard approach. He sees a lovely lady at the bar. She's got a delicious martini. There's her olive. Anyway, she's having a good time. She's chilling over there. Larry wanders in and he sees her and he says something that he's, he's read online is potentially being successful. He says, your legs must be tired because you've been running through my head all night. Th this doesn't work. She takes her drink and she throws it in his face splashy splashy vodka all over Larry's face. He's not happy about this. Now the, the, the drink in Larry's face, that's, that's an addition of an aversive stimulus. No one likes to have vodka in their face. That's not fun. So what this is, is a positive punishment. It's the addition of something bad that will probably discourage him from doing this again. Now what also happens, which is, which is bad, is that it turns out this girl was like probably the worst girl to approach with this because her boyfriend is the bouncer and he's muscular. He's a muscular guy. He's not happy that Larry has tried to get his girl. So the bouncer says, you know what, Larry? I don't want you in here anymore. It's been, you know, I know you like coming to Moe's, but no more. Larry has been banned. Now this, Larry really likes this bar. It's like right around the corner from his house. It's really easy to get to. So Larry's upset about this. And this is what's, this is a negative punishment because what's happened is that something that Larry likes, which is going to the bar, has been taken away from him. So it's a negative, an appetite of stimulus has been removed from the situation. So Larry's, Larry's unhappy, and he's sure, sure not going to say that line again. No way. But then, so, you know, so Larry, he knows that if he just keeps at this, he'll get it eventually. Because he's seen all these testimonials of people who are just as, you know, weird and loserish as him, who figured out how to get women, and they have great lives. So he decides to go to another bar, and he finds that this bar has a karaoke machine. Ooh, now he can sing. He observes this guy singing and realizes that all of the women are really into it. They think he's, they think he's adorable. So Larry decides to be that guy. Larry's like, oh yeah, I can do this. I can sing. Um, so he tries it and he sings a little song, you know, my darling, you look wonderful tonight. And ladies love it and he gets someone's phone number, which is, you know, really what the goal of all of this was. And this is a positive reinforcement because it's certainly a good stimulus. It's an appetitive stimulus and it's being added. He didn't have the number before and now he does. So Larry, Larry's really happy. So he keeps singing and what he finds is that at this bar, they don't throw drinks in his face no drinks and they don't ignore him and what this what this is is a negative reinforcement because all these bad things that were happening to him before when he was being sleazy are not happening anymore so it's the subtraction of an aversive stimulus he doesn't get vodka thrown in his face anymore and he doesn't get ignored so this is like he's really excited he's totally just gonna keep on singing now one there's one last thing to talk about with operant conditioning, and that's the idea of extinction. You know, so Larry, things are going pretty well for Larry. He's singing, he's getting girl numbers, the ladies love him. But over time, you know, maybe a couple of them go on dates with him, and what they realize is that he's, he's really, you know, he's a, he's a good singer, he seems great when he's on stage, but he is a little sleazy. You know, he hasn't really changed. <laughs> doesn't really change his personality. So the women start to be not that happy. And when he gets up to sing, they're not, they're not clapping anymore. They're kind of like, you know, maybe they start ignoring him. Maybe they don't really give him the same kinds of rewards that they gave him before. And if this continues to happen, if he continues to sing and not be rewarded, 
eventually his behavior will become extinct. He'll sing less and less, and eventually he'll probably stop entirely. And this is what happens if you're getting reinforced for a while and then it stops, eventually you stop doing that behavior. So your behavior basically gets, you know, changed by different responses, but that's not permanent. You have to continually get reinforced, otherwise you the behavior will go extinct. So just as a you know, quick quick review, I know this is well, it's a little complicated. Larry basically, when he tried to do the line, when he tried the pickup line, um, he got both a positive punishment, which was getting the drink thrown in his face, splash, 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 and he also got a negative punishment because he got thrown out of the bar, which he really liked to go to, no more mo's. And when he sang, he got both a positive uh, reinforcement he got he got someone's digits <laughs> and he also got a negative reinforcement because girls are no longer ignoring him and throwing drinks in his face so this is how and so Larry so with all of these collected responses Larry has clearly decide, decided to go with the music route so his voluntary behaviors were reinforced in various ways, you know, punished and reinforced, such that it led him to kind of an optimal behavior to get phone numbers. In the early 1930s, a man named Burhus Frederick Skinner began to study psychology in a radical new way. See, before him, we only knew how to condition reactions. We could condition a person to be terrified of pumpkins or hungry at the sight of office supplies. But Skinner theorized that you could go one further. He theorized that you could condition volition, that you could change the way that people made choices. So why are we talking about it? Because a vast number of today's games are built upon Skinner's discoveries, and it's starting to become a bad habit. But before I get ahead of myself, let's take a closer look at what Skinner did. Skinner created a machine, a simple box with a button in it, that he would put pigeons in. When the pigeons pecked at the button, the machine would give them food. He then hooked the box up to a recording device so he could tell how often the pigeons pecked the button. Seems simple enough, so why was this so groundbreaking? Because pecking the button is active. This wasn't just an automatic reaction to stimuli, it involved making a decision. So if Skinner could show that he could consistently change how often the pigeons pecked the button, he could show that he could condition them to make a specific choice. This is called operant conditioning. Now there were two amazing parts to his findings. One, operant conditioning works on humans, Two, simply rewarding someone every time they do an action isn't the best way to keep them continually doing that action. Rather, if you provide a reward to a person after they perform the action a random number of times, or only give a reward once every so many minutes, these methods are far more effective at conditioning someone to repeat an action. Skinner often talked about operant conditioning in terms of gambling. Most gambling games are not rigged in the gambler's favor, and oddly enough, most gamblers are well aware of this. And yet, they continue to gamble rather than perform an equally strenuous job that has a regular payout with a higher net profit. Consider which activity people will tell you is more fun. Spending eight hours in a casino playing the slots and ending up with a hundred bucks? Or pushing a button in a factory for eight hours and getting a paycheck for a hundred bucks at the end? This is all compounded by another discovery of Skinner's research. He demonstrated that primary conditioners, or rewards that are fundamental biological needs, you know, food, water, sex, etc., have a diminishing effect once a person reaches satiation, or the biological limit of their needs. But then there are secondary reinforcers, things outside the biological realm, like money or social approbation. These things generally don't hit a satiation point. You can probably see where we're going with this. Many of you have played Farmville or World of Warcraft well past the point where it was fun. Why? because those games are very clearly built around reward schedules. The entire design of both of those games is to condition you to continue to repeat an action that has long since lost its novelty, that has long since become tedious. Actually, before we continue, quick disclaimer. Being conditioned to do an action and being addicted to something are very different. We're not going to go into the addiction thing today, but I just wanted to acknowledge the difference. All we're going to talk about today is how games can condition us. Okay, disclaimer over. So why is it a problem if games do this? For now, let's ignore the questionable morality of using Skinner's theories to create games. The problem is that it's a lazy and cheap way to get someone to believe they're enjoying your product. Have you ever finished a game and then looked back a few weeks later and thought, what the hell was I doing putting 80 hours of my life into that? That usually happens because the game used Skinner's techniques to create the illusion of engagement and extend playtime. RPGs, especially poorly made ones, are a great example of this. 
Everything from loot drops to leveling is a very clear reward schedule that reinforces the behavior that gets you the reward. Ever been playing late and getting sleepy, but then decide that you're going to get just one more level before you go to bed? Yep. But this isn't just an RPG problem. It's endemic. Almost anything with points uses this system. Ask your grandmother sometime why she plays so much Bejeweled. But it goes beyond points, too. It works with anything that has a clear and manifest reward. Solitaire, the most played game in the world, sets up the infrequent win as a clear reward. Many action games use the same system to convince players to mash the same buttons for 12 hours straight. Even elements like the voiceovers and shooters that tell the player how awesome they are can be used as conditioning tools. It's also one of the main reasons every game is getting RPG elements these days. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with adding RPG elements if it's being used to create deep, immersive systems for the game. I'm actually a huge fan of this trend when it's used to combine mental challenges and execution challenges, like in Call of Duty or Dungeon Fighter. But too many games are using RPG elements as a crutch. Bland, uninspired games will include reward systems simply to delay your realization of how terrible they are. My point is, there are other, better ways of fostering engagement, and those are the methods we should be demanding from our games, not simple Skinner box satisfaction. Here are a few examples. One, mystery. Human curiosity is a powerful thing. We like unraveling mysteries. We've all played a game that made us ask, what the hell's going on? Immediately followed by, I want to keep going to find out. Two, mastery. The player can be engaged by giving him the opportunity to master a skill and then utilize that mastery. You see this sort of thing in rhythm games, fighting games, sometimes even RPGs. This one's a little tougher to execute in traditional games, but we already kind of talked about this in our Easy Games episode, so moving on. Three, mental challenge. Oddly enough, most of us don't actually get enough mental stimulation in a day. From the thought problems in Professor Layton or Myst to the logic stomping of a Civ game, giving players a way to work their brains is a great way to keep people interested. Four, narrative. You ever get lost in a world? Continued playing a game just because it was a place you wanted to be? This, as well as linear story narrative, is a great way to engage players. 5. Novelty. This one's hard to maintain, but human beings like new things. We're engaged by novelty. This is why brown shooters may wear thin, but Planescape doesn't. 6. Flow. Games like Everyday Shooter, N2O, or even a really good session of the original Alien vs. Predator can bring a player to a sort of zen trance. We've all been there at one point or another. Your eyes enter soft focus, your blinking slows, your breathing becomes incredibly regular, and you are just... doing. There is no controller. You and the screen are one. You've stopped thinking in the ordinary sense of cognition, and instead are working on some much deeper level. This is very hard to design for. It basically involves creating rhythm within play, and then slowly demanding the player to start performing actions faster and faster, building momentum until they're performing the actions faster than they could possibly think through them. It's hard to pull this off as a designer, but achieving this experience is deeply compelling in a game. Now, this is just a small set of non-conditioning ways to make games fun, and no good game relies strictly on one. Most of your favorites combine many of these elements. So to all designers and future designers out there, we have to get away from this increased reliance on Skinner Box methods of compelling gamers to play our games. Engagement and compulsion are different things. Just because you can make an experience compelling doesn't make it a good game. Well, thanks for watching. See you next week. Dance.